Hello ladies and gentlemen, everyone in between beyond. My name is Taylor and welcome to the art table for October 2024, this time featuring Dosi, the magnificent digital artist who does a wide variety of characters, character combinations, and styles that I'm really excited to show you today. Before we get into the video, I do want to do the quick disclaimer, so stick around for that, and then we'll really get into Dosi's work. So to get the usual disclaimer out of the way, I do not take any sort of kickback, promotion, discount, commission, payment, or anything of the sort in relation to these videos. I do this purely for the love of the artwork. If I have had a commission done by the artist, I will let you know. If I do not mention it, then that means I have not had a commission done by them. All commission pricings, all commission prices, timing, everything like that is set by the artist. Any deals you make are between you and them. I am in no way involved, cannot get you a discount, cannot get anything sped up, and cannot get you in contact with them. That is purely up to you. They have every right to refuse, every right to set the time frame they feel is appropriate, and the price they feel is appropriate. Please do not share their artwork without their permission. I have written permission from every artist that I feature here on the channel, and please do not share my video without the appropriate watermarks and the appropriate disclaimer, because I am sharing someone else's work with their permission for me to share it, not for you. With all that being said, let's get into the video. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get into the first one. I loved this Dragon Knight kind of paladin figure. He almost felt like a kind of general, a very, you know, strong leadership vibe uh, coming off of him. And I really wanted to start off with this because it was such a solid, you know, it gave me such this strong impression. And I have to wonder if this is an existing character or an original creation. I loved the armor's saturated crimson coloring contrasting and highlighting the lighter, almost metallic-looking uh, indigos and violets of his scales. They stand as a mighty sentinel fighting for their kingdom until their dying breath, but they are not a mere soldier. No, they held a status, as nobility or even royalty of some stature, the crest of their family and home adorning their shield, a constant reminder of why they fight the endless sea of hordes that seek to take everything from them. And when the fight is done, they will rest their head one final time before departing. They gallantly hold an enchanted sword, which they wield with deadly efficacy on the battlefield. It is a mix of savagery and majesty, as many dragonborns are. I love the mixture of colors that, that use the deeper crimson, along with the more subtle grays, as opposed to, you know, kind of a shining silver. They give off a much more intimidating feeling. They also have this air of maturity to them. They don't need these flashy colors or the brightest armor. They have a war to win, and they have no time to deal with such trivial matters as renowned for their appearance as it will not ease their burden. All that is to say nothing of the minute details that Dosi has factored in when designing every element of this character, including the difference in light because of the sword lightning. Uh, it all feels very thoroughly designed, and the armor feels like something with a mix of fantasy and practicality. It's nothing very flashy, but it still befits a commander who needs to maintain some level of pride and inspiration for their soldiers. They give off the air of someone that I would personally follow into battle. It is a medieval fantasy setting, of course, not the modern one, uh, but I do need to move on to the next piece, which gives off a much more ominous air. Now, this one really stood out to me because it wasn't something that I was used to seeing. The clearly skewered, malevolent spirit of a rogue or an assassin coming directly at the viewer. When I first looked at this piece, I had two different thoughts. The first being that this was an adventurer who was betrayed by their party, whether directly or by being thrown into some sort of trap, but the other was this was a member of a party who had wanted to undertake more gruesome tasks, such as assassinations, and the rest of the party did not have the stomach for it, or they took it too far. Whether before or after their death, they seem to have been taken over by some sort of malicious force. Just from the look in their eyes that their hood had shadowed, the grim smile on their faces also does not inspire a lot of confidence that their target will make it out alive. That is a smile that revels in death, one that soaks in blood, and one that wields a blade and always craves the feeling of flesh. The arrows protruding from their back are a telling sign their death was not a peaceful one. It was one where they could not face their killer or killers. They may have died knowing their assailants, or they may have died knowing nothing but the pain of the arrows in their back. I love the spectral appearance and the fact that Dozy has shown it being more translucent in certain areas, but also the wisps 
coming off of their arms, all had this feeling of, you know, kind of an ethereal being, this spiritual being compelled to satiate their bloodlust, and you, the unfortunate one in their sights. I also love the small details from the belt, to the kunai along their legs, and the small, you know, little examples uh, showing the movement of the fabric that envelops them. But unfortunately, once again, I do need to move on. Now, I think this was the first piece to really catch my eye because it felt like it had the same energy as like an Elden Ring boss in terms of its general impression and the physical appearance. This wolf dragon creature was fascinating because it was not only covered with chains, but also wields a massive sword. Now, I would imagine the scarlet coloring from being immersed in molten rock for hundreds of years. This scene looks to me like he's fighting one or more of the beings that have imprisoned him. Covered in broken chains and shackles, he grabs hold of his blade, ready to tear everyone else limb from limb. I almost wonder if the wolf did not originally have the wings, but they were grafted onto his body in some sort of horrific experiment. The wings look almost draconic in nature, which is what sparked the thought that they may not have been from the same creature. And it would also explain why there are four of them. It could just be a really cool looking winged wolf and I'm reading way too much into, which is probably true. Uh, but I do appreciate this image gives off a much more natural feeling, not just with the lava and the sky in the background, but also the use of the brush strokes to give it a hand painted texture. Especially when you look at the outside edges of the wings, they all have this look about them as though they had seen years of combat and the you know, kind of small holes, the small tears, especially when you look at the top left wing with uh, those small holes, which makes it feel almost more real. Additionally, I love the shifting color palette from the bottom to the top of the image. Normally a character is lit from above, but here most of the light comes from below, and the harsh warm tones slowly give way to a much cooler night sky. I feel the heat from the volcano and the crisp night air clashing as he pulls his blade from where it's been kept for many years awaiting its master to be swung once again. Now, I do want to move away from the fantasy side of things for a moment. I liked this image because of its comparable simplicity in terms of content to some of the other works. It shows a woman running away from someone or something for an unknown reason. No idea what sort of danger she's in. All we can tell is that she's running with a purpose, taking with her only the clothes on her back and the small sapphire necklace which holds some significance for her. Much like the little that she was able to take with her, the image does not have a lot of extra details or things happening. It is very clear and straightforward, creating such a different feeling to many of the other pictures. The only standout colors of the necklace and the background are important because they allow the viewer to appreciate the character's simplicity. Her hair was also a standout for me because it was such a dark midnight black and contrasts well against that you know vibrant, harsh red background. Her pale skin also works well as the eye transitions and moves downward. This escape is not one made in the heat of the moment. She's been planning this for months from the expression on her face. It is not one of fear or distress, but one of focus. She understood what she had to do and was executing it accordingly. She could be escaping from many very unpleasant situations, so I don't want to speculate on what those could be and will not do so in the video. I will let you write that portion of her story. However. I do want to showcase what she could be running away from. Now this one was certainly the most eye-catching piece that I had seen on Dosi's, one of Dosi's pages, uh, and I knew I had to showcase it. I am unsure where this creation originated from, or if it was completely original design by Dosi, uh, but I was getting a very strong feeling of like, I was getting a very strong feeling of horror comics with a mixture of say Junji Ito and a hint of Bloodborne. Its ferocity almost tears through the screen with a blood-curdling scream. I think the grayscale streak style creates a stylized appearance and gives off very similar vibes to, say, Itadori from JJK using Black Flash for the first time. The lines giving off such an intense energy when it's not even moving is rather intimidating. Additionally, the spikes coming off of its back give it this silhouette of a much less human appearance because, for the most part, it has a muscular humanoid outline before you add those protrusions and take the face into account. I almost wonder if this could be some sort of werebeast, meaning that there is a human that becomes this creature under certain conditions, such as their choosing or some form of adrenaline rush. I don't see this beast as a mindless killer. No, it holds savagery and ferocity for its single target. 
and it will tear down the heavens to spill their blood. It will not stop until its teeth sink into their neck and their claws have felt the tearing of its flesh, making it all the more terrifying because it will not simply kill those around it. It is a hunter above all else. I almost wonder if it was once a hunter of monsters or demons, maybe even just with a simple villager whose family was slaughtered in front of them, changing due to their all-consuming hatred or making a deal with the theoretical devil. The prices for the ability to enact their vengeance is the loss of their humanity and embracing becoming one with the darkness within. I really picture this as being close to a nightkin from the Castlevania Netflix series, but let's tear into something just a little less fleshy. So, thank you everyone for sticking around so far, we have reached the midpoint of the video. If you have not yet, please make sure to check out Dosi's art pages. Again, I am unsure if they are open for commission at this moment in time, but you are always free to message him and ask. We have five more amazing images to go through, so I hope you'll stick around for those. Now, I'm sure that I've made it very clear uh, <laughs> at the time of the recording, I have been playing the Shadow of the Erdtree DLC, so the first thing that sprung to my mind is Rolana and her twin blades of Cinder and Sorcery. Now, I do not believe this knight was based on Rolana, as it is older than the DLC and plays with the idea of dueling fire and ice, a classic combination that gives a lot of depth and diversity to how she fights. According to the description, uh, her name is Lyra, hope I'm pronouncing that right, and she is an eldritch knight, destined to fight and kill the demon king. Her piercing blue eyes and flaming crimson hair foreshadowed her proficiency with both the conflicting elements of fire and ice. Her ability to wield them in tandem is important as it meant she could fight with more versatility and form before unseen strategies and tactics. Now I have to wonder what her training was like. Was she marked to fight as a hero since birth, or did she come into the role later? Maybe enlisting as a soldier or knight and then hearing the call to become a hero during her career. I appreciate the swords have different hilts and blade shapes to accommodate their different elemental affinities because he could have simply duplicated the sword and placed a different aura around it, but decided that they should each be different. I also get the sensation that she was filled with some sort of internal conflict because she held an affinity for both, she likely has a mix of emotions and reactions that may be polar opposites. I also love the color choices of the deep red cape paired with the midnight blue armor. Neither of them overwhelm the other and work well in tandem to complete this look. Combine all that with the fine and intricate details placed on the armor, such as the dents, gashes that she's accumulated through several battles as she fought to reach the Demon King, fighting for her own sense of justice. Speaking of which, I picked this next piece for a sense of justice as well. Now, I am nowhere near knowledgeable enough about the Warhammer and 40k universes respectively, uh, but I do have some friends, shout out to both Kenny and Caden, who absolutely love 40k and have shared small snippets of lore with me. So this was titled as a Justicar. By definition, she's an officer. This one was titled as a Justicar, who by definition is an officer of justice. I imagine that they're the ones who weed out the heresy within the Imperium of Man, and honestly, I grabbed this one because it was such a beautiful highlight of Dosi's eye for details with all the super small and intricate little things that go into such a sophisticated piece. Especially when you look at the left arm, the lighting changes that could occur with such small space that obscure and highlight various details of his armor are incredible. Speaking of lighting, the choice to have such a dark setting with a dark gray armor is interesting and seems very thematic because because as much as I know about the lore, it is often not rainbows and sunshine. I wanted to highlight some of the small things that Dosi did not need to include, as honestly, they were some things that I missed the first time I looked over this piece. Those being the small apostle attached to the Justicar's left leg, and some of the other smaller details around it. It is so tiny they could easily go unnoticed, yet he felt compelled to include it. It blends in with the dark shading upon first inspection, and I have a tendency to zoom in and kind of go all around the image as I write the script, which is when I found it. Most people won't stop and stare as long as I do for these videos because, you know, they have lives to live and Dosi knew this, but still chose to include it. That demonstrates his dedication to doing his best work, even if it goes unnoticed. Now, I wanted to grab this next piece because it was kind of a departure from uh, some of the other things that I've included in today's video. I really like this sketchbook and I really like people just working with pencil and paper and that you know like physical medium uh, because it's it's a dying medium and it's a dying art so 
So I love this piece of a woman who looks like she came from the modern world and was thrown into a world of Princess Mononoke. It demonstrates the different skill sets that some artists have. I know some people who only work on physical paper and others who only do digital. Both take an incredible amount of time and dedication to develop your skills and really show what you can do. So when an artist comes along and is able to do both, that's even more incredible. From the necklace to the way the clothing shifts and blows in the wind and the sword hilt all demonstrate that no one ever gets to where they want to on the first try. It takes dozens, if not hundreds of iterations to get to the point where they're happy. You can see the faint eraser marks. You can see the different ideas that Dosi had that they wanted to change again and again and again. This may have taken a few minutes or a few hours. There's no way to tell. But Dosi clearly wanted to be satisfied with the end product, and that means tweaks and changes. He even took the time to lightly shade the space behind the character to help give them an impression of wind blowing around the dust that would have been on the ground. He was not content to simply leave it blank. It needed a sense of character to make the real character feel even more in place. But I do want to cover something just a little more colorful for the penultimate image of today's video. This is apparently Rena, Rena, not entirely sure, uh, from Star Ocean 2, a classic JRPG from the late 1990s that I personally have never played, but I can feel the love and appreciation that Dosi has for the series in this rendition. What I love the most about this was the heavy saturation in her colors and the small, subtle changes in shades and hues, such as the tiny portion of green at the top of her hair and the lighter sky blue undertones that give it so much more definition and add some great variety to the overall color palette that lets them all shine even brighter. Her eyes follow a similar pattern of a deep ocean blue on top, slowly fading to a sky blue as they move downwards. Mimicking the changes to her hair, even the blush in her cheeks is subtle, but also helps accentuate her face. The colors of the armor is also very vibrant and saturated, with changing hues based on the way she is facing, which changes the way the light hits her clothing. And additionally, the difference between the rougher fabrics and the smoother metallic pauldrons is well shown in the ways that they react to the light. To conclude, I wanted to move on to something I do know a little bit better. Now this one, I know on two different levels. The first being Pokemon, and the second being Sadness. The sadness that I feel whenever I have to select only 16 images for this video, because I have to leave so many amazing works from so many people out. Now I understand that I will link everything down below, please do check out the artists that I've featured and look at all of their works, because they are incredible, they are phenomenal but I have to be very selective about what I choose to show in the video, both for YouTube's monetization policies, uh, to make sure I'm showcasing artists' work properly, and to make sure, you know, the audience is pulled in with something they're going to really enjoy to get more eyes on the initial pieces so I can expand the people looking at the artists. Every artist that I have covered and will cover in the future are spectacular at what they do, and I always feel bad when I have to leave some or most of their work out of the video. I love the brushstroke aesthetic of this poor little cubone. I also appreciate the different thicknesses and the outlines which highlights the body to different degrees. It also seems to be affected by the light source as it is thicker where the shadows fall and much thinner or non-existent where the light touches it. Most of us know their backstory, but for those of you who don't, the canonical cubone was kidnapped by Team Rocket and its mother died defending it. And so cubone wears her skull as a way to remember her. It is tragic, but also holds an important lesson for us all. We should always carry the skull of our deceased relatives wherever we go. Now, for obvious reasons, that is a joke. Please do not carry around the remains unless it's their ashes, and that's in a very secure container. But, but to carry their memories with us always. It doesn't always have to be a physical object, but I'm personally an advocate for them. I have a necklace uh, from my grandparents, a bracelet from my mother, a couple's ring with my wife, and a ring for some other family. I carry memories in these items with me. It almost makes me want to cry when I see this little baby probably experiencing one of the most traumatic things in their life. In spite of all of that, he holds a defiant look in his eyes as, for, as a single tear rolls down his face, and he knows that he will have to live up the rest of his life alone. Well, ladies, gentlemen, everyone in between and beyond, hopefully you are not alone. If you are, I'm very sorry. Uh, but keep living your best life, you know? Please make sure to check out Dozy's work. I have linked all of his stuff in the description down below. He does amazing stuff. I really hope you can find something that you know kind of speaks to you, and I hope if Dosi is open to commissions, you are able to come into an agreement with them. 
this was a long one, and this was kind of an emotional roller coaster, so I appreciate you sticking around all the way. Uh, if there are any other artists you want me to cover, please send me their contact information. I will certainly contact them and see if they respond. I'd be happy to have them here on the channel. I do have artists lined up for the rest of 2024, but 2025 is completely open, so I hope to kind of get a slew of messages about who I should feature next year. Thank you everyone for being here, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye!